Okay, hi, I think I will start immediately. So I will be talking about the GraalVM's polyglot feature. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Milda. I am a software developer at Wix in the Vilnius office in Lithuania. So that's why I'm not afraid of the rain because it rains all the time there. And this is the picture of my dog because I think my dog is extremely cute and I put the pictures of her everywhere. So just nod that you agree with me. Thank you. So uh, I will get uh, into GraalVM now. So later this year, uh, Oracle introduced its JVM extension called GraalVM, uh, as B has already told you about it. And one of the main selling points of it was the uh, polyglot feature, the ability to write uh, truly polyglot languages. And this is the introduction that I stole from the Oracle's site, from the GraalVM official site. So don't read all of it, it's uh, nonsense. But what they say is that they will allow you to write a seamless polyglot application, which will be very high performance because there will be no additional cost in crossing the barrier between different languages inside your uh, program. So I, will, uh, I, will like to, I would like to in this presentation to actually answer if it's true or are they lying. So I will start with uh, why, we, why do we want that, what problems it uh, solves, and have you ever wondered how many programming languages there are? Because I did when preparing from, for this presentation, and the, pen, and the answer might, might vary depending of your, of your sources and uh, of some criteria, like for example, is this a programming language? Because this is an actual program, it's a hello world pro program of a programming language called Emoji Code. You can check it, it actually has some nice uh, documentation, so you can use it if you want, but uh, I don't know why. So then I consulted the source of all truth, if, especially if you're, uh, you were ever in school, uh, Wikipedia, and I found that they have listed uh, over 700 programming languages. And that is a lot of languages. And uh, why do we need that many? Why can't we just create an Esperanto of programming languages? The original one did so well, this will probably <laughs> work as well. But uh, no, as you know, we don't have a uh, same criteria, what makes a programming language good? And different programming languages are good for, for different uh, tasks and different programs. And uh, that's why we usually choose one of them. And then, but as some of the languages are so much better than other things, we sometimes want to communicate between different languages. And how are we doing it right now without the uh, If, for example, we want to call an R code from our Java application, we have these languages implemented on different virtual machines and to go from Java to R, we will have to leave our virtual machine, go to the another one and then go back. And this is obviously a very, very costly operation. You would have to go through some kind of pipe or some kind of REST interface and then the data and stuff. It's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work. Also, if you would tell anyone that GraalVM is so cool because it allows you to write, for example, Ruby on JVM and it could uh, talk with uh, Java, everybody would say like, what the heck, we already have JRuby, like what is the difference there? And it would be a fair point because uh, JRuby is a Ruby, it's on JVM, it allows you the interoperability between two different languages. Uh, but uh, this is uh, not a perfect solution, of course. Because, as P has already told you, and I will mention it again, uh, JRuby, as how JRuby works, uh, the Ruby code is compiled into the Java bytecode, and it is blindly thrown inside the JVM, and even the JRuby developers themselves don't really know how it is being optimized there. What's happening inside, nobody knows. Uh, the JVM is a black box for, 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 for many of us. What uh, GraalVM did, they removed the step of compiling uh, your, uh, your source code into the Java bytecode. Instead, they, uh, they opened a big API, which allows the language developer to pass optimizations. And they implemented all of the languages in a compatible way, which allows to mix and match different languages. And I will go into detail about that quite soon. But before that, I want to quickly mention uh, Nashorn, if anyone knows it. It's a <laughs> it's an Oracle itself, uh, JavaScript implementation on JVM, and which was quite unexpectedly deprecated with the Java 11. And with the, with the GraalVM, it kind of makes sense as the JavaScript implementation on GraalVM is so much faster and so much more efficient. And they were even nice enough to give, uh, to give you optional backwards compatibility for the better migration from Nashorn to 
GraalVM. So if you're using it, you better be listening to these presentations because you will have to use GraalVM. So uh, how actually the polyglot and GraalVM works? I won't go into too much technical detail. If you want to too much technical detail, you should read this research paper by Oracle. It's, uh, it's a research paper. It has formulas and stuff. and it's, 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 it's difficult to read, but it's also very interesting. It will answer all, all of your technical questions much better than I do. So, uh, GraalVM made a polyglot uh, work by introducing a polyglot interoperability protocol. It's a very long and difficult name. Uh, but what it means is that they define the set of uh, messages and each language has to <laughs> map their language specific operat operations to this, uh, these messages. As for example, in this uh, very nice graph, uh, the uh, ob uh, object access operation on J JavaScript, which is a language specific operation, is being mapped to the language independent the message read and then the uh, C language implementation has the same message mapped to their language specific operation of accessing an object and then on runtime uh, this uh, JavaScript language specific operation can be changed to a C language specific operation through this message and to actually better understand what I just said you have to remember what Pius told you that uh, in GraalVM world uh, each of the programs are represented as three data structures so this is uh, my uh, JavaScript uh, code. It's a equals object dot value. And uh, your, your language interpreter uh, translates your source code into this kind of tree. And then this kind of tree is compiled into the, into the machine code. So, but what would happen if uh, the object into the, in, the, in this code is actually a C code? It's actually a C object. So the, and the accessing this object is a language specific operation. So while translating your source code into the, into the tree, the language interpreter would change this language specific operation into the language independent message, read one. And then on runtime, this language, in, uh, language independent message would be changed to a, uh, or your foreign language, the language that you're interoperating with, a language specific operation. And then from then on, this is how our program representation would look like. And actually, the compiler itself do doesn't really care at all where do these three nodes come from. Uh, it can be JavaScript, it can be C, it can be whatever. And also, you can pay attention to the is C node as if uh, on runtime you would dynamically change your object from C to Ruby. It could uh, easily come back to this uh, language independent state and then map it to the C language specific uh, operation and uh, the program would just go on further. So, so what is the performance of uh, languages implemented like that? As you can see, there is almost no, actually almost no cost of crossing the language boundaries. It uh, depends on basically on the languages itself implementation on GraalVM. And uh, if you if you listened a couple of years ago, they said that the goal is to have a similar performance as Java has, but if you go to the GraalVM page right now, they call their performance competitive, which is a word to describe performance. <laughs> so uh, I think it's the time to see how it actually looks. And I could just made some slides, but what's the fun and danger in that? So I will try to do some live coding. And but I have only one hand, so. So I will write a Java and JavaScript uh, application because this is the languages that I work with. Well, I actually work with Scala, so but it's the same thing. So okay, to start writing our polyglot application, we were we will firstly create a polyglot context where we will be able to evaluate our foreign language, the JavaScript. So we will create a builder for for JavaScript and build a context. That was quite easy. And now actually that's all we need. Uh, we can just uh, we can just evaluate some, I will put the language ID, it's JavaScript again, and we will pass some JavaScript code. If you don't, don't know, this logs to a console <laughs> in JavaScript and we will write a hello. I will just save it and my terminal is pink. Uh, don't, that, don't judge me, but, but here it actually looks quite white, but 
I don't know what's that. OK, so uh, you can see that I'm using the, the GraalVM's uh, Java implementation. And now I will just uh, compile and run my class. And it says hello from JavaScript. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> OK. Uh, so, so this is pretty pr pretty nice, I guess. But what uh, would we have to do if we would like to uh, print some message that is being defined in uh, in uh, in Java? Uh, okay, so we have our message. We want to print it inside. Uh, our JavaScript uh, program, but it won't work so uh, seamlessly here. For that, we will have to uh, ac access a bindings object. So co uh, context has a bindings object for each of the languages, which is which allows you to access the the symbols in the in the foreign language. So you will understand. I forget how to type when I'm doing live coding, but it's OK. Mm -hmm. So we access the JavaScript bindings. And in these bindings, we can, OK, this is not the right place for them. Uh, we can put a new mem member, which will be our so we can put the message inside it. I will save it. I will compile and run it. And it works. <laughs> uh, we can we can actually do the same by, like, if we define a, a symbol inside the JavaScript, we can also get it. Uh, like, if I would have a message in the, in, the, in the JavaScript code, we would get it like that. But I think you get how it works, so I won't show it. And, and I swear it works. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would also like to show is how would you execute a function that's being defined inside the JavaScript. And I have it in this. In this file, it's a it's a JavaScript file. It's a it's a function, and uh, I will get I will have to. Okay, no, okay. Uh, so to access this file, I would uh, I would load it, and inside the I will write the JavaScript code to load this file. Um, actually, I won't be able to access it right now because by default the context doesn't allow the. Uh, IO operations. So now I could it could work if I yeah it will work it should work and uh, then I can get my member out. I will get it out, and I will I will print out the result of it. So I have to explicitly say that I'm executing it, and you uh, and you saw this file takes two two values, and so I, it will be three and four, let's say. So okay, it should uh, should probably work. It works. <laughs> and uh, one more quick, very quick thing. Uh, there is, I have this uh, Java class called dog. It has, a, it has a name. It can bark. And I would like to execute, uh, like do something with this class inside my JavaScript code. And I can also do that uh, like e equally. I, like, just as you would expect, I will. Um, It's a, it's a dog. It, I will put a dog there. I will execute the dog file. 
this sounds weird. I don't need this anymore. I didn't actually define what is a dog. So, uh, oops, I forgot to. Okay, I have this. I have my JavaScript, which will make the dog print the dog's name and make it bark. So, okay, okay, I will compile and run again, and it works. <laughs> Had some downtime, of course, and the first one was, uh, is it, so, is it really seamless? Like, really, Oracle? Because I saw a big, ugly seam in the middle of my program. So I think the, the fact that this program is supposed to be seamless is, uh, is a lie. Uh, also, even the, the Oracle developer, the developers themselves do not recommend to just uh, mix your program with different uh, program languages unless you want to keep your job security. You, have, you, have you want to have a better job security because, as you can imagine, the mainten maintenance of such a program could get quite ugly. And what was a really downside for me, that out of the box, it, uh, from Java, you cannot ex uh, uh, access uh, Node.js. You're actually accessing a JavaScript, the ECMAScript 8, like the pure JavaScript. So there goes my dreams of having Lodash in Scala. Uh, but are there any valid use cases? Of course, yes. There are some very specific tasks, as for example, if you have, you have a Java program and you want to do some machine learning, uh, we all know that Python or R are much better at it, so maybe it's worth it to mix it in with your, your Java program. Also, if you're migrating your code from one language to another, it could be very useful for this intermediate state. And if you want to use some libraries, like from front end, some validation or something, you, can, you could do it pretty, pretty nicely, I guess. So, is it new? Is it fast? Is it exciting? Yes, will I use it in my next project? Uh, I'll think about it. Thank you.